This is Limelight America. Here's your host, Michael Drew Shaw. Thank you, Lynette, and welcome to Limelight America, where we present one-on-one personal conversations with interesting people from all walks of life. These up-close encounters with people of the fascinating and inspiring kind include business, entertainment, sports, and artistic entrepreneurs, scholars, role models, and philanthropists who impact the quality of life for us all. We're talking with Thaddeus Waro, the author of Radicals and Visionaries. I have to believe you have a couple of favorites. You know, growing up seeing I Love Lucy, I was considered Lucy to be a brilliant comedian and Desi just her straight man. Desi was not only an excellent businessman, but he was quite an innovator. All right, you build companies to sell them. Now, I started out with Chung King Chinese Foods in 1944, and I sold R.J. Reynolds tobacco for $63 million in 67. I have seven banks because I had to put the money somewhere. <laughs> Playboy was not Hugh Hefner's first magazine, but it's the one that led a sexual revolution in the 1960s and earned Hefner recognition as one of America's most astute entrepreneurs. Ironically, as the bar on social acceptability was lowered, Hefner saw his empire nearly crumble in the 80s because of competition from lowbrow imitators like Penthouse and Hustler. Like most dream warriors, Hugh Hefner began pursuing his dream as a child by writing mystery stories and drawing cartoons. His first publishing effort at age 16 was called Shudder, with a comic strip and movie reviews, a members-only publication with annual dues of just five cents. More on Hugh Hefner another time. You're listening to Limelight America. Coming up this half hour, the fascinating story of Coco Chanel. There's a new book out called The Ubiquitous Persuaders by George Parker. Now, I'm going to quote directly from the jacket flap. If there were an emperor of advertising, I'd like to think he'd say things like, bring me George Parker's head, braised first to seal the juices, then (laughs) roasted in a nice medley of root vegetables. Yeah, George is a little controversial. He is, after all, the man who regularly refers to Martin Sorrell, probably the most powerful guy in advertising, as the poison dwarf. He calls out big international clients in unflattering terms that often involve genitalia or bottom-feeding fish. George Parker takes Vance Packard's late 1950s bestseller, The Hidden Persuaders, and drags it kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Everything you thought you knew about snake oil purveying on Madison Avenue is lovingly eviscerated, then reassembled in a brand new, improved package. You'll also get George's forecast of where the ad business is going as it sails happily towards the rocks and shoals of irrelevancy. The name of the book is The Ubiquitous Persuaders. The author is George Parker, who I happen to have the distinct pleasure of knowing. Uh, His British accent is a dead giveaway, and it's also very seductive. His manner is outrageous. He spends much of his time in a bar or a pub when he's back home. He lives in Idaho now, I think under a tree or in a cave or something. In any event, George Parker, author of The Ubiquitous Persuaders and other outrageous books, Coming soon to Limelight America. Oh, by the way, uh, the one thing I love about George is he's got a heart of gold. I think you're going to love him too. Her first customers were princesses and duchesses, but she dressed them like secretaries and stenographers in pearls, trench coats, simple knits, turtleneck sweaters, and little black dresses. By thumbing her nose at the styles of the 19th century, Coco Chanel freed women from the suffocating clutches of corsets and bustles and created a fashion revolution that would influence every designer that came after her. In fact, her signature suit, a collarless cardigan jacket trimmed in braid with an elegantly straight skirt is the single most copied fashion of all time. But perhaps this entrepreneur's true genius lay in her shrewd recognition of the value of spinning off her name, a name that would remain one of the most famous and revered in the fashion world even 30 years after her death. 
Chanel's rags to riches story reads like a romance novel. The illegitimate daughter of a poor French peddler and a shop girl, Gabrielle Coco Chanel was born in France in 1883. After her mother died and her father ran off, Chanel spent much of her early life in a convent. When she was 17, the nuns who ran the convent helped Chanel get a job as a seamstress. But the beautiful young woman yearned to escape the humdrum life of provincial France and ran off to become a cabaret singer. While she never found stardom, she did find a rich young playboy who took her in as his backup mistress and moved her to Paris. Always the rebel, Chanel refused to dress her part. Instead of the extravagant satin dresses that were in at the time, Chanel wore plain, dark-colored dresses that marked the beginning of the fashion trend that would make her name famous throughout Europe. To keep her busy while he attended to his other mistress, her lover helped Chanel open her own hat and dress shop in Paris. That arrangement led to bigger and better things when Chanel left him for a friend of his by the name of Arthur Boy in 1913. A wealthy English businessman who is claimed to have been the true love of her life, Arthur provided the capital for Chanel to open two additional boutiques. Chanel had always loved wearing men's clothes, which she borrowed freely from her lover's closets. So it's no surprise that the inspiration for her early designs came from menswear. She even made many of her creations out of traditionally masculine materials such as wool jersey, which had never before been employed for women's clothing. Urged by Chanel, women the world over cut their hair and discarded their corsets in favor of loose-fitting sweaters, blazers, simple knit skirts, trench coats, and Chanel's trademark little black dress. Chanel was so successful that she was able to pay Arthur back in full just four years after he set her up in business. Their affair continued even after he married another woman and did not end until he died in a car crash on his way to join Chanel for New Year's Eve in 1919. Throughout the 1920s, Chanel's social, sexual, and professional progress continued and her eminence as a fashion designer grew to the status of legend. Her growing fame made her one of the in-crowd. She befriended Stravinsky, Picasso, and other members of Paris's exclusive art colony. During this period, Chanel experimented with many different styles, including gypsy skirts, over-the-top imitation jewelry, and glittering evening wear made of crystal and jet beads. It was also during the 20s that Chanel introduced the product that would ensure her immortality. After the death of Arthur Boy, Chanel became the mistress of Russian Grand Duke Dmitri. Through him, she met a perfumer whose father had worked for the Tsar. He was working on an essence for French perfume maker Francois Coty. According to legend, after sampling the scent, Chanel made a few suggestions and then convinced him to give it to her. In 1924, she released it as Chanel No. 5, the first perfume ever to bear a designer's name. Boldly advertised as a very improper perfume for nicely brought up ladies, the dark, leathery, distinctly masculine blend in its Art Deco bottle proved to be liquid gold. Chanel's fame continued to grow throughout the 1930s as Hollywood courted her services and she nearly married one of the richest men in Europe, the Duke of Westminster. In later years, explaining why she chose not to marry the Duke, Chanel replied, There have been several duchesses of Westminster. There is only one Chanel. Chanel's confidence, some say arrogance, was hard won. She worked her way up from literally nothing to become one of the most popular designers in the history of fashion. But with the coming of World War II, her fame would turn into infamy. During the war, Chanel became mired in controversy. When the Nazis marched on Paris, she responded by shutting down her business and becoming involved with a Nazi officer 13 years her junior. In return, he allowed Chanel to continue to reside in her beloved Ritz Hotel. Believing her career as a designer was over, Chanel stayed out of the public eye for the next decade and a half, relying on the sales of her perfume as her main source of income. Then in 1954, at the age of 71, she announced she was making a comeback. Depending on the source, Chanel's return to the fashion world has been attributed to falling perfume sales, disgust at what she was seeing in the fashion world of the day, or simple boredom. 
Some say she became jealous of Christian Dior's growing fame and returned to fight for her fashion crown. Regardless of why she returned, reactions were decidedly mixed. In Europe, her comeback was initially deemed an utter failure. Fashion critics were less than impressed with her new line, which merely reiterated her message of casual chick. But in the U.S., Americans couldn't buy her suits fast enough, and both Europe and the critics soon relented to Chanel's success in America. Like a phoenix rising from the ashes, Coco Chanel once again found herself at the forefront of fashion by following the same simple yet radical philosophy with which she had started, and that was, it's possible to be comfortable and chick at the same time. While it did not destroy Dior, by the time of her death in 1971, Chanel's remarkable comeback had earned her the title of the best designer of her time. Today, Chanel remains not only one of the oldest, but also one of the world's most prestigious active fashion houses. A tribute to her unique vision, the designs of the woman who carried fashion into the 20th century promised to remain just as popular well into the 21st century. Oh, and by the way, as rumor has it, one of the enduring mysteries surrounding Coco Chanel is exactly how she got her nickname. Some of her biographers go along with the story that her father nicknamed her Coco. Others contend that Chanel came by the name during her brief stint as a cabaret singer because her repertoire consisted of only two songs, one of which was Coco Rico. But according to one source, Chanel herself once explained that the name was nothing more than a shortened version of the French word for kept woman. Sydney Biddle Barrows is an expert in experience marketing and sales. She is known today for her innovative, unorthodox approach to sales and perhaps is best known for her reign as the Mayflower Madam when she founded and operated New York's most elite premium priced escort service. Sydney Biddle Barrows, coming soon to Limelight America. Back in 1909, Duncan and Alonzo wanted to start a business. Their idea was to make handy kitchen devices like bottle cappers and ice cream scoops. But like many entrepreneurs, they had no money. Duncan made the supreme sacrifice and sold his car, his prized Maxwell Briscoe runabout, for $600 to Alonzo's father-in-law, who loaned Alonzo $600 to keep things even. They went to work and build a business with annual sales of over a million dollars by the end of the decade. They revolutionized the building industry in 1914 with the world's first electric drill. If you want something bad enough, be prepared to sacrifice and work hard, just like Duncan Black and Alonzo Decker. My philosophy is, when you snooze, you lose. If you have a great idea, at least take the chance and put your best foot forward. Ron Popeil does QVC President Doug Briggs have a shrine to Ron Popeil in his bedroom? Does USA Network CEO Barry Diller send Popeil a thank you card every time his home shopping network racks up another $100 million in sales? Well, if not, they should, because without Popeil, they might not exist. By combining the harried hawking of 19th century fare barkers with the emerging medium of television, Popeil invented the infomercial and set the wheels in motion for the modern home shopping industry. Popeil is the Horatio Alger of the television age, a self-made millionaire who started with next to nothing. Born on May 3, 1935 in the Bronx, New York, Popeil's childhood was anything but idyllic. When he was three, Popeil's parents divorced and abandoned him. Exiled to an upstate New York boarding school, he didn't see them for years. When Popeil was about eight, his paternal grandparents took him in, but life with them wasn't much better. The couple fought constantly and showed him little affection. It wasn't until they moved from Miami to Chicago, where his father manufactured kitchenware, that Popeil found salvation. When he was 16, he discovered a place where he could break away from his bleak childhood. Chicago's infamous Maxwell Street. The gritty equivalent of a modern-day flea market, Maxwell Street was a dirty avenue in a bad neighborhood where a rough-and-tumble collection of street vendors sold clothes, kitchen products, and knickknacks, and thieves unloaded hubcaps, radios, and other stolen merchandise. 
When Popeil saw all those people selling products and pocketing cash, the proverbial light bulb went on in his head. I can do what they're doing, he thought, but I can do it better. Gathering up some kitchen products from his father's factory, Popeil headed to Maxwell Street to give it a try. I pushed, I yelled, I hawked, and it worked, he recalls in his autobiography, The Salesman of the Century. I was stuffing money into my pockets, more money than I had ever seen in my life. I didn't have to be poor the rest of my life. Through sales, I could escape from poverty and the miserable existence I had with my grandparents. I had lived for 16 years in homes without love, and now I finally found a form of affection and a human connection through sales. For the next few years, Popeil would rise before dawn, procure bushels of cabbages, potatoes, radishes, and carrots to use for his demonstrations, and set up his table on Maxwell Street and at fairs and shows around Chicago. Barking from atop a Pepsi crate, he sliced and diced while honing his routine, and people bought his gadgets. Some weeks he made as much as $500. Popeil used part of his earnings to enroll in the University of Illinois, but after a year and a half of attending classes, he decided college just wasn't for him. Leaving the university behind, Popeil decided to move his act indoors. He cut a deal with the manager of a Chicago Woolworths to let him push his products in the store for a piece of the action. Popeil hawked a variety of products, most of which he purchased from his father, including shoeshine sprays, plastic plant kits, and food slicers. Working six days a week and selling products manufactured by his father and other suppliers, the natural-born pitch man was raking in upwards of $1,000 a week at a time when the average monthly salary was $500. Popeil was still demonstrating products at Woolworths when he made his first venture into TV marketing. He immediately recognized the tremendous potential of the new medium and began looking for ways to take full advantage of it. His main problem was money. Television commercials were expensive to produce and air, and Popeil simply didn't have the funding. Then, in 1963, a friend told him of a TV station in Tampa that would let him make a commercial for $550. To Popeil, that was just a half week's pay, and he figured he had nothing to lose. All he needed was a product. For his TV debut, Popeil wanted an item that was new and different. None of his father's products filled the bill, so he scoured the market for new items. During his search, a friend told Popeil about a high-pressure hose nozzle he felt was the perfect product for a TV pitch. By inserting different tablets made of detergent, car wax, fertilizer, or weed killer between the hose and the nozzle, you could wash and wax your car, fertilize your lawn, and kill weeds. It was a better mousetrap, Popeil reveals in his autobiography. It was a great product to begin my TV career with, because everyone could use it. Popeil bought a small quantity of the product from its Chicago-based manufacturer, named it the Ronco Spray Gun. Ronco is short for Ron's company, the name he chose for his fledgling venture, and began advertising it on TV stations throughout the Midwest. Popeil wrote, directed, and starred in the commercial himself, then aired it during whatever unsold time he could buy cheaply from local TV stations. In doing so, he wrote the first chapter in the history of direct response television sales. As Popeil had predicted, the Ronco spray gun was a tremendous success. Upon seeing his son's achievement, Popeil's father asked him to sell a revolutionary new food slicer he developed called the Chopomatic. Popeil agreed, and once again he wrote, directed, and starred in his own commercial. Like the Ronco spray gun, the Ronco Chopomatic was an immediate hit. The Chopomatic was the biggest success Popeil's father had ever seen. Flush with newfound dollars, the elder Popeil started dreaming up Chopomatic sequels and eventually came up with the product that would make Ronco a household name, the Vegematic. Thanks mostly to the Vegematic, Ronco's annual sales skyrocketed from $200,000 to $8.8 million in just four years. Popeil decided it was time to take his company public and asked investment firm Shearson Hamill to underwrite the initial public offering. Hamill agreed, but suggested that Popeil change the name of his company. Ronco didn't really say anything about who we were, Popeil explains in Salesman of the Century. They wanted a name that was descriptive of what we did. So we became Ronco Teleproducts Incorporated. When the offering went through in August of 1969, 
Popeil became a multimillionaire overnight, and a direct response TV marketing dynasty was born. Over the next 20 years, Popeil would introduce late night TV viewers to a bewildering array of miracle products, ranging from the Dialomatic and the Buttoneer to the Pocket Fisherman and Mr. Microphone, many of which he invented or helped design himself. Ronco's stock soared, and Popeil, whom one entrepreneur quipped could sell fingernail polish to the Venus de Milo, became a jet setting millionaire. By the 1980s, Popeil had sold records, choppers, slicers, dicers, hosiery, pottery, candle kits, and much more. But dark days lay ahead of the Hemingway of home shopping. In 1984, Ronco, but not Popeil, was forced into bankruptcy when a bank called in a loan unexpectedly and seized the company's inventory. Popeil, demoralized but undaunted, bought back the inventory, rolled up his sleeves and returned to the county fair circuit. For a time, his blip vanished from the radar screen. In 1989, Popeil launched his television comeback, blitzing cable stations with infomercials for a product he dreamed up a decade earlier, a food dehydrator. The Einstein of the infomercial proved his genius once again. In one year, he sold more than $150 million worth of dehydrators. Back on top, Popeil followed with GLH9, spray-on hair, a pasta maker, and a sausage maker. After 40-odd years of selling everything from tapeless tape measures to bottle and jar cutters, Popeil has hawked just about every kind of gadget imaginable. And with sales of his latest project, the Showtime Rotisserie and Barbecue, going strong, Popeil promises to remain TV's top salesperson well into the 21st century. In fact, although he has often talked about retiring, Popeil concedes that he probably never will. Oh, and we almost forgot Ron's rules. Popeil credits much of his success to his philosophy that all Ronco products must abide by two rules. Number one, the product must be needed by lots of people. And two, the product has to solve a problem. You're listening to Limelight America. You absolutely, positively have to innovate, if only to survive. Fred Smith. While attending Yale University in the mid-1960s, Fred Smith wrote an economics term paper on the need for reliable overnight delivery in a computerized information age. His professor was less than impressed and responded, the concept is interesting and well-formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. Several years later, through a combination of innovative thinking, unbridled charisma, and sheer determination, Smith would use this interesting but unfeasible concept to found the world's first overnight delivery company and change the transportation industry forever. Smith was born to a well-to-do family in 1944 in a small suburb outside Memphis, Tennessee. His father, who died when Smith was only four, became a self-made millionaire after founding the Dixie Greyhound Bus Lines and a chain of restaurants called the Toddle House. Smith was born with a congenital birth defect, a bone socket hip disorder, which caused him to wear braces and walk with the aid of crutches for most of his youth. His mother worked diligently to build his self-esteem and encouraged his participation in all sorts of physical activities. He eventually grew out of the disease, and in prep school, Smith played both basketball and football. After earning a bachelor's degree in economics from Yale, Smith enlisted in the Marines and was sent to Vietnam, where he received an education of a very different kind. As a platoon leader in Vietnam, I was in charge of a group of youngsters who had come from very different backgrounds than I had. You know, blue-collar backgrounds, steel workers, truck drivers, gas station folks. Smith revealed that in a 1998 Fortune magazine interview. The experience gave me a very different perspective than most people who end up in senior management positions on what people who wear blue collars think about and the way they react to things, and what you should try to do to be fair to those folks. A great deal of what FedEx has been able to accomplish was built on those lessons I learned in the Marine Corps. 
After two tours of duty, Smith left Vietnam weary of destruction and eager to focus his energy on building rather than tearing down. I wanted to do something productive after blowing so many things up, he remembers. His stepfather, retired Air Force General Fred Hook, had bought a struggling company in Little Rock that modified aircraft and overhauled their engines, and Smith went to Arkansas to help him run it. Difficulty in getting parts brought Smith back to the overnight delivery concept he'd hit upon in college. Determined to make it work, he came up with a plan for creating an integrated air and ground delivery system in which packages from all over the country would be flown to a central point, or hub, then sorted, and then flown out again along specific routes or spokes to their destinations. Under this hub and spoke system, the flying would be done at night, when air lanes were competitively empty. The airports used would be in sizable cities, and trucks would carry the packages to their final destinations, whether in those cities or smaller communities. Convinced his idea was feasible, Smith decided to take the plunge with $4 million he'd inherited from his father. At that point, Smith's life became a marathon non-stop journey into the canyons of Wall Street. That's where he would raise the capital he would need to purchase the fleet of airplanes vital to his plan. I was kind of naive about the whole thing, he confesses in a Nation's Business Magazine interview. I thought there would be baskets full of checks right away. There weren't. But Smith kept at it. His charisma and the knowledge he'd gleaned from several years of studying the air freight industry, both in the military and Vietnam, and later back in the U.S., impressed investors. And by the end of 1972, he had managed to raise $80 million in loans and equity investments. Federal Express, FedEx, began operation in April 1971 with 14 Falcon jets serving 25 cities. Initially, business was slow. During its first night, FedEx shipped a mere 186 packages. But volume picked up rapidly and service was expanded. FedEx was an overnight success. Then the roof caved in. Because of rapidly inflating fuel prices, costs surpassed revenue, and by 1974, FedEx was losing more than a million dollars a month. Smith asked his disappointed investors for more money to keep the company afloat, but they refused. Bankruptcy was a distinct possibility. But then fate stepped in. While waiting for a flight home to Memphis from Chicago after being turned down for capital by General Dynamics, Smith impulsively hopped a flight to Las Vegas, where he won $27,000 playing blackjack. The $27,000 wasn't decisive, but it was an omen that things would get better, says Smith, and indeed they did. Returning to his quest for funds, he raised another $11 million. Although FedEx had lost nearly $13.4 million in its first two years, Smith never considered giving up. I was very committed to the people that had signed on with me, and if we were going to go down, we were going to go down with a fight. It wasn't going to be because I checked out and didn't finish, he says. Thanks to an aggressive ad campaign which featured the now famous line, FedEx, when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight, the company scored a profit of $3.6 million in 1976. Smith listened to his own counsel and single-handedly changed the way the world does business. And P.S. People plus service equal profit. A key ingredient in Federal Express's success has been a corporate philosophy that emphasizes treating its workers fairly. Managers are carefully trained to foster respect for all employees, and their performance is monitored. Managers are evaluated annually by both bosses and workers to ensure good relations between all levels of the company. Fred Smith believes that fair treatment instills company loyalty, and company loyalty always pays off. Limelight America is produced by the L.A. Radio Network.